Uh, thanks a lot for, for the invitation to present here. Uh, my name is Srinath. I'm uh, an assistant professor of computer science at Brown University in the United States. Um, I, my group works primarily on 3D computer vision and machine learning. And today I wanted to talk about some of the new stuff that, uh, that is coming out of our lab here at Brown. Um, and uh, yeah, feel, please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. I know we have a small set of audience here on Zoom. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, let's, let's start. So uh, the subject of today's presentation and, and my talk today is going to be uh, canonicalization in 3D computer vision. I'm going to explain what I mean by canonicalization, but essentially, you know, most of today's talk is going to be about taking chairs, uh, flipping them around, and then making sure that we can arrange them uh, in order. So that's at a very high level. What I have here on the top is, uh, you know, I have three chairs which are oriented uh, in a consistent way. Uh, I'm going to reveal four more chairs, and uh, for folks who are live on Zoom, uh, if you could please type on chat or just unmute yourself uh, and tell me which of the four chairs that I'm going to reveal have the same orientation as the chairs that you see on the top. So you're ready? All right, let's go. Is it A, B, C, or D? Of course, C. C? Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, I think uh, both of you agree that it's uh, C. Uh, so that's right. So what you've just solved, the task that you said just solved of matching a bunch of shapes to a bunch of other shapes, this task is called the mental rotation task, right? And this is something that has been widely studied in, studied in cognitive science, uh, most notably by Shepard and Metzler in the 1970s, uh, where they took two different shapes and, and tried to mentally rotate uh, these shapes and figure out that you know humans can do it well, uh, and you know uh, figure out some other details how long we take to perform these mental rotation tasks and so on and so forth. Now it turns out that mental rotation is quite fundamental to uh, how we operate in the world. For example, imagine this scene uh, where you know a bunch of chairs are strewn across, strewn across on the floor, right? Uh, if you, as a human being, if you, if you want to kind of set these chairs in order, rearrange these chairs. What we need to do is need, we need to have a sense of what upright chairs actually look like. We need to have a sense of what uh, a standard canonical chair that is in upright position looks like. So if you don't know that, we really cannot uh, arrange these chairs back in order, right? And it turns out that if you want to build machines, we want to build robots that can do similar things, uh, we actually need to be able to end our robots with the same capability, right? So we need to build robots, AI machine machines that uh, can mentally rotate uh, these objects so that they can operate in the 3D world just like humans do. So this is a very important and fundamental task. Now, you know, if you're you know active on Twitter and if you take things that are said on Twitter very seriously, you might you know look at statements like this, uh, which claim that today's neural networks, today's artificial intelligence systems are slightly conscious, right? So you know we are, we are talking about things like consciousness of neural networks. So you know solving tasks like mental rotation should be pretty trivial, right? So we are talking about consciousness, but to just mentally rotate some stuff should be pretty trivial. Well, um, it turns out that things are not quite quite as straightforward, right? Uh, mental rotation, which is also called rotation canonicalization, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, it turns out that this is actually quite a difficult task to solve automatically for computers, right? Um, so much so that these, this is actually used as a task online to differentiate between robots and humans. Uh, you might have, many of you have might, might have uh, seen these uh, captchas on certain websites. Uh, this is called an image rotation captcha, right? Uh, the task really is you need to, you're presented with an image which is rotated in, in a random fashion. And the task is for humans to rotate the image so that it's, it's in some ways canonical, right? It's in some ways um, upright, right? Um, and and you know, this task is so difficult that uh, we, this is actually used to differentiate between humans and, and robots online. Now, so let's, mental rotation, as I, as I mentioned, is referred to as, uh, is also called rotation canonicalization, right? So you have a, a concept for what a, a, a standard object looks like, and you're presented with uh, an object that is rot rotated differently, and the task is essentially to rotate it so that it looks standard in some way. Right? So canonicalization essentially refers to the process of mapping data to a standard or canonical form of sorts. Right? So in the case of the image rotation capture, uh, 
the task is to rotate that object so that it looks like the object is upright. Mathematically, uh, a canonicalization can be described using a canonical map where the task is to take a set which represents some underlying data and to map that set to another set uh, with, which has some notion of an equivalence relationship. In the case of mental rotation, the equivalence relationship is rotations, right? So we are saying that two rotations um, are identical, you know, if they look a certain way. So this is this is what we refer to mathematically as a canonical map. Now it turns out that we can canonicalize for different properties of objects. Uh, we can canonicalize for position, orientation, velocity, and things like that. And the example of mental rotation that we saw earlier is an example of orientation canonicalization. So we take an object, the object has lots of extrinsic properties, right? So these properties are defined with respect to some other external frame of reference. This includes things like position, orientation, velocity, and so on. And a mental rotation or rotation canonicalization is an example of uh, an extrinsic property of orientation. So if we can canonicalize that, we get, we solve the mental rotation task. But there are, of course, other properties that we can canonicalize for. Uh, these properties include things like uh, articulation, uh, shape parameters, or object class, and so on and so forth. So, so there, there's really a lot of uh, different properties that we can uh, canonicalize for. Orientation is really not the only one. So you know, in this talk, when I refer to canonicalization, I, I re what I really mean is canonicalizing for lots of different properties of objects, not just for rotation, as we saw earlier, but also things like articulation and shape and so on. Okay, so um, obviously it, canonicalization is something that's fundamental in many computer vision tasks. Uh, for instance, in 2D computer vision, we've seen a lot of success in 2D computer vision, right? So we've seen uh, tremendous success in object detection and uh, segmentation and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it, canonicalization in, in, in 2D computer vision has never been a big deal for several reasons, right? So the first reason is that 2D computer vision primarily deals with images, which are a regular grid of pixels where the pixels are uniformly separated uh, and they have a canonical or a natural coordinate system, right? So typically in image processing and computer vision, we treat the top left corner of the image to be the origin, the x-axis to, to be uh, on the right of this origin and, and the y-axis to be um, uh, below the origin, right? So these are, uh, this is like the natural coordinate system that we primarily employ for uh, for these tasks. So there is there is a natural order, natural frame of reference. Also in 2D, rotation, if you want to canonicalize for rotation, rotation is, that is just one degree of freedom for rotation in 2D. So if you take a shape, you can rotate it about the, the uh, an axis passing through the plane of the image, right? And that's the only degree of freedom that objects have in, in two dimensions. So you know the degrees of freedom are fairly low. There is of course camera projection, right? So images are fundamentally projections of 3D objects, but usually this is addressed using data augmentation. So people uh, augment their data with lots of different views, lots of different perspectives, and so on and so forth. And finally, you know, 2D translation is handled automatically in many cases using 2D convolutional neural networks because 2D convolutional neural networks can detect chairs no matter where you see the chair on the image. Right? So they are what is known as translation equivariant. Um, so because of these reasons, canonicalization has not been a big concern in 2D computer vision. So when we deal with images, uh, this has not been something that, that we really care about. On the other hand, uh, 3D in 3D computer vision, it turns out that canonicalization plays a more important role. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, there is no natural coordinate system in 3D. Uh, we can observe uh, 3D shapes in any different position, any orientation. Um, so there is no natural frame of reference that, that we have in 3D. Uh, furthermore, the, uh, let's say we have a point cloud which represents a 3D shape. Uh, the, the 3D points can be in arbitrary order. So they are not in any specific order. Right? So if I specify, um, you know, let me, let me try to get my pointer here. All right, so you know, let's take a point on the top left corner of the chair here and the bottom right. So these points are specified in a certain order when we try to process this information. But if I swap the order of these two points, it makes no difference, right? It's still the same shape. 
So you know the 3D points are the order of the points does not really matter. Whereas in images, the order of the pixels do matter, right? So that's that's one of the things uh, to keep in mind here. In 3D, we have more degrees of freedom for rotations. Uh, objects can rotate along the x, y, or z axis, right? So it's a much more complicated rotation space. And finally, uh, there is you know more translational degrees of freedom in 3D. So objects can translate across x, y, and z dimension compared to just x and y in two dimensions, right? So for these reasons, uh, it's really it, it's been really hard to kind of build 3D computer vision systems uh, because you know th there is no naturally defined coordinate system and and you know we are operating in a much higher dimensional, uh, higher degree of freedom uh, space. After that, before we continue, can can I get a reference to this this slides right now uh, so that I have it in the background? And we should have also added it to the event page, uh, so I'll take it in the background and I'll add it also now. If it's if it's okay, yeah, I, uh, I'm happy to send it after the talk. I mean, it's a PowerPoint. Sure. I can do that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when people try to solve these three D computer vision tasks, um, what uh, uh, you know, in in two D we have data sets like ImageNet and Microsoft Coco and so on and so forth. And similarly for 3D, we have data sets like ShapeNet and ModelNet, uh, which are widely used data sets that are used for learning 3D shapes in different contexts, right? But one of the things that is kind of um, not very obvious is that these data sets are explicitly canonicalized. So what I mean by that is if you look at the airplane category in ShapeNet, all of these airplanes are canonically oriented, meaning you know, the front of every instance, object instance, you know, is facing the same direction. And they're all canonically translated and positioned. So all of these objects are positioned at the origin, orienting, you know, for example, the front of the fuselage is facing the positive X axis, for example. And this is also the same with a model net 40, right? The, and this, you know, fundamentally makes learning easier because, you know, the objects are pre-canonicalized. Unfortunately, and, and by, by the way, way just about that shape it actually invested a lot of resources into canonicalizing these things they had a full team with uh, automation also helping them to put everything in the right directions on the three axes um, this is something that's like it's two lines in the paper itself but actually a lot of the work was exactly on this point um, that's right. yeah. so people spent a lot of time annotating for for this data set to be canonical right? yeah uh, and this is something that, you know, as you said, it's two lines in the paper, but it turns out that it's actually a pretty big deal. Uh, so uh, just like we do image augmentation in 2D, is it not helpful to do similar transformations here in 3D just to remove the canon canonicalization? Good question. Uh, you're right in the sense that we could probably learn to abstract away these, um, these different rotations and orientations just by doing um, augmentation, but you have to keep in mind that the space of augmentations in 3D is significantly larger than in 2D. So in 2D, you could just take you know, different views, uh, you could rotate images, right? Uh, but the number of degrees of freedom in 2D is far few compared to the number of degrees of freedom in 3D. So in 3D, we have three rotational degrees of freedom, three translational degrees of freedom. We also have scale, right? So these are things that we don't necessarily have um, on images. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, Go for it. So, uh, can can all, this word canonicalization can it be construed as a uh, registration or three D registration that I'm personally aware of? In in some ways, yes. Um, it depends on you know whether you're trying to register the same shape or different shapes, right? So here we have primarily interested in different instances, right? So we are not just looking at one kind of airplane, we are looking at different types of airplanes. And here canonicalization actually means different types of aircraft are canonically oriented, right? So it's not just the same instance. Whereas in registration, we typically talk about one instance and you know we have two different orientations of the same instance and we try to canonicalize for that, right? So, it's, so I think there's, they're definitely related, but there's also some important differences. I see, I see, thanks. And this is also the case for other kinds of data sets, like take the uh, SMPL data set, for example. SMPL is a, is a uh, parametric body model 
Um, this is, you know, from scan people. So they put lots of different people doing different kinds of motions in, in, in a scanner and they create like a 3D model of these people. Um, but it turns out that there is actually connections or there's correspondences between these different uh, shapes, right? So for this person over here and for this person over here, we know exactly which part of uh, this person's finger corresponds to this person's finger, right? So we have explicit correspondences, and this is actually a way of canonicalizing, right? So they're all part of the same underlying 3D mesh, and therefore they are canonical in some way. But it turns out that, you know, the data on which we actually want to operate look a bit like this, right? So if you go to the internet and download 3D models of cars, uh, you get cars that have arbitrary orientation. Uh, I mean, different artists probably create different orientations. Some people prefer the positive Z axis for the front, others uh, prefer the positive Y axis, right? So different people have different notions of what canonical is, right? And similarly, what you see on the right is an example of a depth image. Uh, and depth images also don't have a canonical frame of reference, right? So we know how far away things are, but we don't know in what coordinate system they are, right? So they are in some unknown coordinate system. So if we uh, take a depth image, if you have a depth image of the same scene from a slightly different perspective, we end up, uh, you know, they don't align, right? So we might have to do things like registration, for example, to figure those things out. Okay, and there's you know plenty of related work in the 3D computer vision literature that tries to address exactly this problem, right? Um, so there's lots of work in the human uh, shape estimation community where you'll see people talk about a canonical space. So this is usually something like a T pose where everything is mapped to, uh, you know, if you're trying to reconstruct people from video, for example, you map every single pixel to the T pose and then you know do the reconstruction there and then repose it to what you see in the video, right? So this is a common uh, thing that's done. Um, and uh, also for objects and other articulating shapes, you often find people trying to solve exactly the canonicalization problem. So finding correspondences between your observations and some platonic uh, version of the object or the, or the category of objects that you're interested in. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna talk about in the rest of, uh, rest of the time that I have is some of the work that we've done on trying to solve canonicalization. Uh, first, I will focus on methods that are fully supervised, meaning we have explicit labels for uh, what the inputs are and what the outputs should be. Um, and But later in the talk, I'll, I'll talk more about some of our recent work where we've tried to do this in an unsupervised or a self-supervised fashion. So just to be clear what our inputs and outputs are, uh, let's say you know we are interested in solving the canonicalization problem in a supervised way. So our inputs could be, for instance, 3D point clouds. So these are uh, inputs that you get, for instance, from um, depth maps or some kind of a laser scanner, right? So, so that's a 3D point cloud. What we want the output to be is a canonicalized version of those shapes, right? So in this case, we have a bunch of uncanonicalized shapes, and we want the output to be a canonicalized version of those shapes. And here we are primarily focusing on rotation canonicalization but you can also think of things like scale and, and translation canonicalization. We want to uh, build a neural network or several neural networks that solve this problem in a fully supervised fashion, meaning we know exactly what the mapping is between the input shape here and the output shape here. So we know what rotation takes the input shape and, and makes it the output shape. And finally, we want a method that works for categories of objects, right? So not just one instance, because if you had just one instance, we could probably solve this using registration, classical registration techniques. We want to do this using uh, for, for a category of shapes, so different instances across uh, categories. Okay, so to solve the, the supervised problem, uh, the first um, concept that I'm going to introduce is this uh, idea of a normalized object coordinate space, or NOx for short. So the idea here is that given a category, let's say a camera, we'd like to define a normalized object coordinate space. So that's that's where the name comes from. Where you know here this is represented by this cube that you see here, this colored cube that uh, you know goes from zero 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 on the bottom right to one 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 on the top left. Right? So it's a cube, unit cube. Now what we do is given a category of uh, shapes, in this case cameras. So ShapeNet already has pre-canonicalized instances, right? So we saw earlier that ShapeNet actually annotated so that all, the, all of these shapes are oriented consistently. So what we do is we take all of those shapes, which are canonicalized, and place them inside this unit box that you see here. Now, this unit box is, is canonicalized for a few different things. It's canonicalized for orientation, clearly, 
but it's also canonicalized for position because in shape net they also normalize all the objects to be at zero 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 and finally it's also canonicalized for scale so all of these objects lie within a unit bounding box inside this queue right so this is the canonicalization uh, uh, that they do so the rgb colors that you see on the canonicalized object representation they refer to the xyz position of that particular point on the shape within this unit queue so this is our representation that we call this Knox. Now the goal is, um, you know, for us to use Knox to solve different kinds of problems. I'm going to be giving a few examples of some of the problems that we solve using using this representation. Uh, first, I'll talk about pose estimation, uh, object pose estimation, uh, but I'll also talk a little bit about reconstruction, uh, and others have done work on articulated pose estimation uh, as well as learning uh, canonical representations and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's let's start with um, 6D pose estimation. So what is uh, six degree of freedom pose estimation or six DOF pose estimation? Um, so the goal here is given an RGB or an RGBD image that you get from a depth sensor, for instance. We'd like to figure out what the position and orientation of the object are in 3D. So hence the six degree of freedom, right? So three degrees of freedom for position and three degrees of freedom for rotation, right? So that's that's our goal. So the input, um, so we want the output to be three positions and three orientations. This is a problem that is, uh, that, that's been uh, looked into extensively in the literature, right? Uh, but most of these methods have been limited to instance level six of pose estimation, meaning we have the CAD model of the object. And what we need to figure out is how that CAD model fits the data that we have. Uh, but what about you know in most real examples we don't actually have a cat model right so you know i have a bottle here we don't have a cat model for this bottle right so how do i figure out where that bottle is so that's that's one of the limitations of previous work now before i explain how we actually solve this problem at the category level uh, i need to kind of extend this nox representation one more step uh, into the so-called nox maps so let's see what nox maps are so we uh, talked about the Knox representation, which is this unit cube container that contains different instances from, from a category, right? So let's say we have a camera that is looking at this container from a certain perspective, so from a certain viewpoint. Now this camera is gonna observe an image that looks a bit like this, right? We call this image a Knox map, kind of like a depth map, right? So this is an image that you, a snapshot of this representation that you take from a certain viewpoint. Now, it turns out that this Knox map actually encodes a lot of rich information. Um, first of all, you know, we can actually read out because, you know, remember that the colors actually represent XYZ coordinates. So given a Knox map, we can actually read out the XYZ position of every single pixel in the Knox map. So we can actually get a 3D partial 3D point cloud of the shape. So that's um, the first uh, insight. Uh, the second insight is that we actually have 2D to 3D correspondences. So we know exactly which point in 3D space corresponds to which point on the image, which means that we can actually solve back for the original camera pose from which this image was taken. So just from this image, we have both 3D information. And because we have correspondences, we also know where the camera was originally. So we have some uh, rich encoding of, um, of what we have. Okay, so you can interpret Knox maps um, you know, in different ways. I'm not gonna go into the details here, uh, but essentially, you know, you could think of this as a derived representation. So we go from Knox uh, and then we get these so-called Knox maps. So Knox maps have a lot of relationship to a bunch of uh, previous work. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the details here, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it offline about what are the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, now going back to the problem of uh, six degree of freedom pose estimation. Uh, we are given an RGB image with a bunch of objects. Uh, what we do is we train a neural network. In this case, this is um, uh, this is an adapted version of Mascar CNN, which is a, a neural network that is widely used for uh, object segmentation, instance segmentation. So what we do is, you know, we have a, an RGB image, and we have the you know typical Mascar CNN pipeline that gives us a class label, and it also gives us an instance mask. So it tells us where the objects are and gives us a segmentation of these different objects. Now, what we did is we add an additional branch to Mascar CNN, where instead of trying to just predict the class label and the instance mask, 
we also try to predict the NOx maps of each of the individual objects. Now, recall that NOx maps actually tell us where the object is. Uh, so they don't just give us information about what uh, what the object is, but they also tell us the X, Y, Z position. They, they do a reconstruction of the object effectively, right? And therefore, this gives us a way to figure out where the camera is relative to all of these different objects. Now, knowing the camera pose is equivalent to knowing the object pose. So, you know, if you have an object somewhere, and then if you know where the camera is, that's the same as saying, I know where the camera is and figuring out where the object is, right? So the, these are, you know, trans, um, you know, you could think of this as transpose problems. Okay, so we trained this, um, you know, mask CNN to, and remember that this is fully supervised, right? So we have a data set for which, for every single RGB image, we have the corresponding NOx, NOx map. So this is a question of uh, supervising this, this method uh, using the sup dense supervision that we have. So we trained this uh, using a robust L1 loss function. And um, here are some, um, okay, before I go to the results, uh, so this is what we do. Um, just a quick uh, you know, insight into how we actually get the object pose. So let's say from an RGB image, we e extract, we estimate the uh, NOx maps. Uh, we also have the corresponding depth image because we're assuming that we have an RGBD image, right? And then we can solve a post fitting problem uh, using Omeyama's algorithm. And that will give us the 60 pores of each of these objects, right? Uh, so we actually get the 60 pores, but also it turns out that we get the size and, and the partial shape of these objects as well. And uh, you know, the, the most important feature here is that we don't need any CAD models at test time. So the, this is a completely, this is learned on lots and lots of instances. And then at inference time, we can operate with without having any explicit CAD models. So here are some, um, some results. Uh, on the top, you see the ground truth NOx maps, the, top, the two left columns, and the last two columns here represent the, uh, the 60 pores of the object as, as a bounding box and a coordinate system. And on the bottom, you see uh, what our method is able to achieve. right? And, and this is using full supervision. I have a question on the previous slide. So, is it the case that uh, the NOx map prediction is bad for rotationally invariant objects? That's a good question. Yes. Uh, so you're right in the sense that for objects like a bowl or a, mm. or a bottle, uh, they have an axis of symmetry, right? Um, so I don't. I, I didn't mention this in the previous slide, but we do have a way to handle these symmetries. Uh, so we actually treat all of these symmetries as uh, equivalence classes, and then we enforce a loss that says any of one of these symmetries we are happy with. Um, so that's that's part of the, the training pipeline. Okay. And one more question. Like here, for example, we have many objects. Some of them, for example, the laptop is easier to like, the, the, it makes sense to like the knowing the orientation is more trivial, right? Does that information also help with other objects? Like if we are able to estimate the camera with respect to the laptop, does that help with the other objects? I see. Um, so in this case, we we don't we treat objects independently, uh, so we don't have any um, dependence between these different objects. But that could be an interesting direction where you try to look at different objects and then you try to constrain the problem. Okay. But here, in this case, we don't do that. Okay, so uh, what, what I just talked about was just one application of the supervised canonicalization representation that we call NOx, right? Um, but there's you know a bunch of other applications as well, and I'm gonna take maybe five, five minutes to go over some of these applications and uh, not in too much detail, but just show some of the, um, you know, some of the key results. So let's look at uh, reconstruction next. So, uh, you know, we all, you're probably familiar with uh, 3D reconstruction literature, where you know, if you have multiple views of the same object, there are well-established techniques that can give us a 3D model of the object, right? Uh, but most of these techniques assume that we have the camera pose. Uh, a famous example of this is CallMap, uh, which is a structure from motion package, uh, where uh, you know you're you're kind of well, st structure from motion is one approach in which you can get the camera poses as well as do a reconstruction. Uh, but most methods assume that we have the camera poses uh, in order to reconstruct the object, right? So here we were trying to ask the question, what if we had a variable number of views? So we don't know how many views of the object we have. Um, and we also don't have camera poses. So we'd like to automatically 
you know, in some some sense, solve the structure for more for motion problem without actually explicitly solving for you know the structure for motion problem. So we have wanted to train a neural network that can automatically give us a shape, uh, pose of the cameras, as well as pose of the object. Now it turns out that you, we can solve this problem again using the Knox map representation. Uh, so in this case, you know, in the previous slide, what you see here are the RGB observations, but we train a neural network that takes in each of these um, RGB images that you see over here and tries to predict the corresponding Knox map. And as we saw earlier, the Knox map gives us a partial reconstruction of the object, and it also tells us where the camera is, right? So that's, that's why we can actually solve this problem. Now it turns out that this representation also has some other useful properties. Uh, for example, we don't have to have explicit correspondences between these different views. Uh, we can do a simple set union operation um, of these different partial observations, and that directly gives us the 3D shape. So we don't have to find explicit correspondences uh, because this canonical representation that we have gives us these uh, correspondence relationships. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much detail. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the details, uh, but very quickly, you know, this uh, approach that we call XNOX uh, has a bunch of, uh, it, it's an auto encoder architecture, uh, which is based on SegNet. Uh, the most important feature of this network, though, is this notion of permutation equivariance. Uh, meaning, you know, if you have different views, let's say we have five views of the same object, all of these five views are equally important. Right? So the order in which we present these views to the network should not make a difference to our final reconstruction. So this network actually has this property of permutation equivariance. So even if you permute your inputs, input views, you still get exactly the same reconstruction. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details here, but it turns out that using something like max pooling, we can actually achieve this permutation equivariance. Uh, I have a question on the previous slide. Can you move? Yes. Uh, where you estimating the camera parameters. Yep. So this one. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this method is it constrained to more like CAD like models or can this work for any basically any object? This can work for at the category level. So it can be any camera, for example, because you know this network that we trained here, this is trained at the category level. So this okay. is trained for all cameras, all cars, right? So even if it sees a new camera that it's never seen before, it's able to predict the Knox map corresponding. To. But not a new sort of category, like a human body or something. Right, that's correct. Yeah, so this is, each of these models are trained per category. So these are categories. Okay. Okay, okay. so, um, but of course, this approach has some limitations. I mean, first of all, there is no notion of a surface. So reconstructions don't look very nice, right? So they, they are a bit noisy. The point cloud looks a bit, bit, bit noisy. Um, and, you know, the set union operation is also fairly independent. So, you know, this is something that we talked about earlier, right? So the objects are very independent. There is no way to actually strongly tie these objects and have explicit uh, constraints on that. So it, it's not the, it's not the reconstruction quality isn't, um, isn't as good as we'd like. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to take, incorporate surface understanding into the pipeline, right? So, you know, we, this is the you know, XNOX approach that I talked about. So given an input image, we're able to predict the partial 3D reconstruction of the shape. But this, this part, partial reconstruction is a point cloud, it's noisy, uh, it doesn't look visually uh, very pleasing, right? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to incorporate this notion of a surface into this, uh, into this approach, right? And there's, um, there's, there's, you know, a few, few different uh, things that we could try, but, you know, in, in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about one approach that we tried, which tries to enforce a surface constraint onto the reconstruction that we get. Um, and this is useful because, you know, then we have this notion of continuity, there is a surface, so points have to be on the surface, uh, and th this results in much better reconstruction quality and reduced noise in, in general. Um, Again, I'm, I'm going to skip through some of the details here and, and focus primarily on the most important insights. But essentially, we have this neural network architecture, which takes in uh, an input RGB image. And then we have an encoder-decoder architecture that reconstructs the Knox map, which is a partial shape. Uh, we also have an unsupervised uh, warping um, 
pipeline, which takes in this, this Nox map and then warps it to some kind of a UV space, which resembles texture mapping in many ways, if you're familiar uh, with texture mapping in computer graphics. And then we have uh, a multi-layer perceptron that takes in the warped space and tries to predict a continuous 3D surface. Uh, and it turns out that this approach is uh, more suited to reconstructing high quality surfaces. So here's an example of one of the reconstructions that we got, right? So the input to this approach is only the five images that you see on the top, right? No other input, no camera pose, uh, no other input. And this is the 3D model that we get from just these five uh, images, right? So you can see that this is now a textured surface. Uh, there's lots of detail and, and so on and so forth. So you know, we can capture all of this uh, uh, continuous surface representation from just uh, five images. And again, you know, this this underlying this reconstruction approach is the Nox map representation. So we have a fully supervised um, Nox map prediction task that the network is trying to solve. So you know, again, uh, canonicalization uh, to the rescue. Uh, get this right. Uh, you're implicitly encoding the surface, right? Uh, it's when you say continuous. That is correct. So this is an implicit shape reconstruction network or, or a neural field. So we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, that's what this is. So we have the UV coordinates, which represent points on this uh, on this um, unwrapped chart. Uh, so in many ways, it's kind of related to uh, more recent neural fields, which are also implicit representations of sorts. Okay, so that's just an example of how supervised canonicalization can be used for reconstruction, right? Again, you know, given a sparse set of views, you can build a 3D model out of these sparse set of views. Now, the final thing that I'd like to mention in supervised canonicalization is uh, time, the temporal component, right? So looking at spatiotemporal uh, data. So, so far, when we've talked about NOx, we've primarily focused on position, orientation, and size. Um, but it turns out that many problems that we want to solve in 3D vision um, also have a temporal component, right? So there is time involved at some point. So in Knox, we don't canonicalize for anything in the temporal dimension. So it's just for the position and orientation and the size. So we were trying to ask the question whether we can build a temporal version of Knox or T Knox as we call it. And the idea here is fairly straightforward, right? So let's say you're, you know, you have a self-driving. You have a, you're in the autonomous uh, driving scenario where you have observations uh, in the form of depth maps of cars, right? As I mentioned earlier, depth maps don't have an inherent coordinate system. So you're effectively uh, looking at points that are in their own reference frame. So they look like, you know, the inputs look like what you see here on the top, right? So you see a different part of the car at every frame. Um, they're not in the same frame of reference, so you can't align them easily, right? So uh, what we wanted to do was to build a method that can canonicalize all of these partial observations, not, not only across space, but also across time. So that's what we call um, a TNOC. So in, in other words, we want our inputs to be uncanonicalized points in a point set. And we'd like to predict a canonicalized version of those points, not just um, in, in, in space, but also across time. So you know, we also get uh, points that we can essentially say that at this time instant, this point was over here, right? So we can do things like that. Um, I'm just gonna quickly move on to the results because um, we don't have time to go into the details, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. Uh, we have, so let's say an input small sequence. Question. Yes, go ahead. Does the object surface change with time? Or are we assuming that the object remains as it is and we just, the viewpoint changes? You, you can do both. Um, this, is, this is just an example where we take viewpoint variation as the temporal component, but you can also do cases where the object shape changes over time. Okay. Both of these are absolutely fine. Okay. But this example is of a rigid uh, object that we are observing at different time steps, so we only have partial observations. So on the left, we have an input sequence. Uh, again, you know, this is the same rigid object, a car, uh, but we see different partial versions of the car, right? Um, what we build a network, which essentially tries to canonicalize this across the temporal dimension as well. So what you see on the bottom is a canonicalization. Again, the colors here represent the, the frame of reference, the, the XYZ, the canonical frame of reference. Uh, and one of the advantages of doing this is that we can aggregate information across time. So we can take different time instances and because everything is canonical now, we can fuse all of these inputs together without actually doing any explicit um, 
uh, correspondence file. Okay. Um, let's see. I think my PowerPoint has crashed somehow. <laughs> All right. We, we see a static image. Yeah, I think my PowerPoint has crashed. Give me just one moment. I'm trying to sure thing. Uh, in the meantime, I'll mention uh, those who joined uh, later on in the session, welcome. Um, this talk is also now live on YouTube and will be recorded and saved there. So no worries if you missed the beginning part. We'll also publish the lecture slides. Um, so we will have uh, that as well. Um, I sent before all the places where you can find the community and all the updates and everything, including the YouTube channel and the Reddit and the Discord. Um, you feel free to join uh, the newsletters there as well. And this is me for, this is enough for my fillers. Uh, hopefully the PowerPoint is working now. Yeah, it's working now, thanks. Um, all right, so what I just talked about is, is an example of uh, temporal canonicalization. And also Peter, how, how much time do I have left? So, it's very fluid. We can set them as much time as we want. Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, so if you need more time, that's okay. Um, it's on okay. us more than anything. Yeah, I, I, I reckon that I have 20 more minutes worth of material at least. So you know, if, if there's no time, go I can just go for it. Yeah. The depth is good. We're not diving too deep into the technical aspect, but the more on the macro level, um, which is valuable, I think. So go ahead. Cool. All right, so, so far what we've talked about is um, canonicalizing for uh, position orientation size, and then we talked about time canonicalization, um, but we can also do things like articulation canonicalization, right? So here's an example of some work that we did where the input is these four images that you see, just the RGB images, and we're able to extract uh, articulated 3D model from just these four images, right? And again, this is based on you know, many of these ideas, the Knox idea that I talked about, where we build a special normalized object coordinate system for canonicalized shapes as well. So we divide the shape into a bunch of parts, and then we canonicalize for each of these parts uh, separately. Uh, and then we discover where the joints are, and we can build 3D models like what you see here on the right. And you can see oh, the same. The, in training time, the shape is actually divided into different parts, and each part is its own training uh, scheme, basically it's its own category. So we have a single category. I mean, again, I, I, I skipped through many of the details here because I just wanted to show the flavor of the things that we can do. Um, but the idea is that, you know, let's say, let's take the example of a laptop, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the keyboard would be one part, the display would be another part. Um, and we would have a separate Knox, court, Knox frame of reference for each of these parts. And we would also have one that is for the entire thing. So we would have full supervision in this case. So we have supervision for the individual NOx, uh, individual parts of the shape. We also have supervision for the entire shape. And then we can find correspondence between these three uh, frames of reference, three NOx uh, spaces essentially. And, and that allows us to do things like, you know, reconstruct this in, in 3D and so on. Okay. So, you know, what everything that I've talked about so far uh, uses full supervision. So we have this representation called the Knox representation. Uh, we supervise this uh, using different um, annotated, manually annotated shapes, right? So if you look, if you think about it, most of the shapes that we show are not real shapes, right? So they're shapes from ShapeNet and all of these shapes have full supervision. And so we know exactly what points correspond to what points, right? So, you know, it requires heavy supervision. Um, there's also some difficulty extending this to other properties, right? So if you want to do articulation, the amount of super supervision that we need it, you know, kind of grows very quickly. So we're really not able to handle those kinds of other properties that we'd like to canonicalize for. Uh, and finally, you know, the Knox representation itself is a dense representation. So even labeling for these tasks is quite difficult because we need to label for every single pixel. So, you know, these are some of the limitations and it turns out that these are, you know, major limitations that prevent us from applying this to real uh, 3D objects and so on. So in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, I'm gonna be talking about uh, some of the work that we've done on trying to move to an unsupervised self-supervised setting. Uh, but before I, I do that, uh, questions? Yeah, training times and hardware. <laughs> 
Um, also, what resolution did you use on the on the shapes and the images? It's different for the different methods that I talked about. Uh, every method has its own different architecture, different training times, and so on. Um, but just as a ballpark, I can tell you that for the three, 3D reconstruction work, we use in the order of hundreds of thousands of uh, example images. So that's you know RGB image, Nox map pairs. Um, we also, I mean, this is usually trained for a couple of days. I mean, I don't remember because this is already work that is two or three years old. Um, so, you know, GPUs were much slower back then. Uh, things would probably be a bit quicker now. Um, but yeah, we are, we're really talking about hundreds of thousands of samples to, to train on. A couple of days, was it like local hardware or cloud hardware? Um, well, both. Uh, so, you know, I think I recollect doing some of these experiments on a, on a V100. Uh, NVIDIA mm. V100, for example, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's like, you know, one or two days of training on uh, V100. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, any, any other questions before I move on? Okay. So now I think, you know, we get to the, uh, the interesting bit or the more interesting bit, which is how do we uh, not use all of this supervision? Right. So the setting is the same as before. Uh, you know, our input is either a 3D point cloud or a depth map or a 2D image of uncanonicalized shapes. Our output is canonicalized 3D point clouds of those same shapes. But the key difference now is that we want to train neural networks that don't use any supervision whatsoever. So there is no explicit Knox representation that we build. We want the neural networks to automatically discover this, uh, this underlying uh, canonical frame of reference. And of course, just like before, we want this to work at the category level, because at the instance level, the problem is trivial, uh, but we want to solve this problem for uh, different instances from, from, a, from the same category. Okay, so it turns out that we need three ingredients in order to solve this problem effectively. And I'm gonna kind of try to explain what these three ingredients are first. So the first ingredient that we need is this so-called permutation equivariance. I mean, this is related to the permutation equivariance, the view permutation equivariance that I described earlier, but this is slightly different. It's more for point clouds, right? So let's say we have a 3D shape, which looks like you know, the chair that you see here. So this 3D shape is represented as a 3D point cloud. So every gray sphere that you see here is one point, and we, you know, this whole shape is represented by, I don't know, like a thousand points. Now, you know, when we describe it, when we give this as input to a neural network, really this is represented as a matrix. And this matrix has a size of n by three, right? So it has n rows and it has three columns. So this is the matrix that the neural network actually sees when we try to process this kind of 3D data. So typically what do we do? We have some kind of a neural network that extracts some features for each of these points or, or the shape as a whole, right? So this is a typical 3D um, data processing architecture. Now, if we permute the rows of the input matrix that represents the shape, the shape remains exactly the same. The shape does not change, right? You just change the order of the rows, but it's still the same 3D shape. But unfortunately, if you were to use a fully connected neural network or an MLP, uh, this MLP does not have the permutation equivariant property. So we uh, shuffle the order of the rows, but we don't get shuffled features, right? So the, the network is sensitive to the order in which we present uh, the points. What we need is a neural network architecture that is also permutation equivariant. So if we shuffle the rows of the input, the, the order of the features are also shuffled, uh, corresponding to the order in which the input was provided. So this is the permutation equivariant property. Now we also want neural, the neural networks that we uh, want to process to, to build these canonical representations to be rotation equivariant. What does the rotation equivariance mean? So let's say we have a new shape, which is rotated from the original shape. Uh, we want the features to also be rotated correspondingly. Right? So that is the property of uh, rotation equivariance. And then the third ingredient is the concept of translation equivariance. I'm not going to repeat myself here, but you know it's, it's pretty clear by now, right? So if we translate uh, the input shape uh, in 3D, we want the neural network to extract uh, features that are also translated in, in some space, right? So that's translation equivalence. Now it turns out that these are the three key properties that we need a neural network architecture to have 
in order to build a self-supervised canonicalization approach. So, I'm, and I'm going to describe what this architecture that we've built uh, is. So, this is a paper that's actually going to be uh, published at CVPR next month. Um, it's called Contour or Self-Supervised Canonicalization of uh, 3D Pose. And the idea here is we have a neural network architecture that has all of these three ingredients. So it has the uh, permutation equivariant property. Uh, so we use a specific kind of neural networks called tensor field networks. Um, and tensor field networks have the permutation equivariant property. Uh, tensor field networks also have rotation equivariant property. And then we also design or modify the tensor field network architecture in such a way that we can also support translation equivariance. Uh, and I'm going to go into some of the details in the, in the next couple of slides. But you know, essentially, the high level picture here is that uh, given these three ingredients, we design an architecture that supports all of these three ingredients. And it turn, turns out that, that with these three ingredients, you can actually build methods that can canonicalize without, uh, without any explicit supervision. OK, so let's look at rotation canonicalization in the first, um, in the first instance. So the idea here is that we have an input shape, which is an instance from a category of shapes, right? So this is, let's say, an airplane. We have our tensor field network, which extracts some permutation equivariant features from the input. And it directly tries to predict an equivariant frame of reference. So what do we mean by an equivariant frame of reference? This is a frame of reference that moves exactly like how the input moves or transforms exactly like how the input transforms. So if the input were to be rotated 90 degrees, the equivariant frame would also be rotated by 90 degrees. So there are many possible equivariant frames, EFX, that, that we can predict using this uh, neural network. But what we need for canonicalization is to predict one equivariant frame of reference that is consistent across different instances in the category. So our goal really is to figure out one particular E of X that takes all of these different input uh, shapes to a canonical shape. Now it turns out that you know, this architecture can also do something more than just canonicalization. It can also do uh, segmentation. So it can segment these shapes consistently uh, into different parts. Again, I'm not going to go into the details here, but happy to talk about this offline. So that's rotation canonicalization. So given this architecture, we can figure out what this equivariant, consistent equivariant frame is across different shapes in the, in the, in the same category. So here's an example of some of the results that we can get using this approach, right? So every uh, column that you see here is uh, canonicalization from one category, right? So on the left, you see just airplanes, you see lamps, you see tables and chairs. And you can see that all of these different instances are canonicalized so that their orientation is consistent across different instances. So they're all pointing in the same direction, you know, oriented in the same direction. So that is rotation canonicalization. Now, what if we have, we don't have um, the full input point cloud of the shape, we only have a partial point cloud. Uh, this is a common thing because if you have a depth map of a scene, you don't see the entire shape, you see only part of the shape, you see only the front facing parts of the shape, right? So this is a common problem. Um, so we've also designed an architecture that can handle, um, you know, the uh, partiality in, in the input shapes. And it turns out that, uh, you know, partiality, handling partiality is the same as translation equivariance. Uh, the thing is, if you have different instances in the same category, you can align all of these instances, but just by just finding the centroid of these different shapes. Uh, but when you have only the partial shape, the centroid does not align with the centroid of the actual shape. So you know you need to actually translate the centroids of the partial shape to the centroid of the full shape. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the details here, but essentially we have this Siamese uh, architecture design here. On the top we have a full shape, and on the bottom we have a, a sliced version of the full shape. So that's a partial shape. Uh, we use our rotation, um, rotation equivariant network architecture that I described in the previous slide to extract meaningful features for both of these shapes. And then we enforce that you know, a reconstruction of these individual shapes should align well with each other. So that's why this is trained in a Siamese fashion. So we have pairs of full shapes and we have shapes that are sliced from those full shapes as well. We have a bunch of losses here, um, which I'm not going to go into, but essentially by uh, 
using the Siamese architecture, we are able to figure out how to match the partial shapes with the full shape and, and therefore, uh, you know, enable translation equivalence. So here's a few results from partial shape canonicalization. So what you're seeing here is the same examples as, as before, except that the input is only a partial version, a colored version that you see here. That is the only input uh, that we have to the neural network. Um, everything else is, is just the, uh, it's just used for visualizations. So the gray point that you see here is only for visualization. It's not something that is input to the neural network. So we're able to canonicalize even in, in, in such cases. Okay, to summarize uh, this part of the talk, you now we, we've developed a method that can take uh, randomly oriented positioned uh, shapes of objects belonging to a certain category. And we figured out a way to canonicalize for the rotation and for the translation of these shapes without using any supervision whatsoever. So this is a fully unsupervised slash self-supervised approach. So there's three key ingredients that enable us to achieve this. Uh, it's permutation equivariance, uh, rotation equivariance, and translation equivariance. We uh, took uh, the tensor field network architecture uh, and we kind of designed a new architecture that uses TFNs in order to support all of these three ingredients. Um, this approach can also handle partial shapes, right? So not just full shapes, but it can also handle shapes that are uh, partial. And this has wide variety of applications. I mean, equivariance is something that is um, pretty exciting in the field of computer vision these days. Uh, we have a lot of papers that uh, are being written about equivariance and how this is useful in applications such as robotics, uh, mixed reality, augmented reality, and so on. All right, so that that uh, is the end of the second part of my talk. I still have maybe a couple of more minutes remaining to talk about some other uh, work that we've done. Uh, but before I do that, any any quick questions that I can take at this point? Uh, for me, I'm somehow missing um, the partial point clouds. How is it missing supervision? Because you do use the full object as part of the training. Uh, I might not have understood something here. Um, so that full point cloud X, um, is it pre-aligned, pre do you know it's um, translation, it's uh, rotation, everything beforehand while training or like what data do you have to know about it in order to have this training working properly? Maybe that's the thing I Yeah, so there is nothing that we need to know about the full shape. Uh, this is mm -hmm. uncanonicalized full shape, right? So these are in random orientations, random position, right? So we don't mm -hmm. need, uh, the only supervision or indirect weak supervision, well, it's not really supervision necessarily, but what we do is we take this full shape and we slice it in, in some way, right? So, we, so that we get a partial shape. The, the only requirement here is that the partial shape, we know which points on the partial shape correspond to which points on the full shape. Okay, yeah. That is the wow. only requirement. That's impressive. And basically you need here to reconstruct the full shape from a partial point cloud in order to understand the canonicalization, the translation. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise the, well, the centroids don't align. So in, in the case of the partial shape, the centroid is somewhere at the front of the wing. Whereas yeah. in the full shape, it's in the middle of the fuselage, right? So that is impressive. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, we, we were pretty surprised that it works at all, but it turns out that there's actually some theory behind this. Uh, and I can, I'm happy to point you to why this works and uh, how this has been applied in different, different contexts. Yeah, if it's a, like links, to, if you can send me after the talk, I'll publish it also in the recording. Um, some people do want to understand the theory behind these things. So for sure, please okay. send over. Happy to do mm -hmm. that. Okay, here's, here's the results once again. And again, I know I want to emphasize that the gray points that you see here, they're not actually an input to the network, right? So it's only the colored points that are input to the network. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. A any other questions before I move on? I'm gonna change gears a little bit in the last couple of minutes. Okay. All right, so the final part of my talk uh, is, is really kind of uh, a very brief, but you know, just to give you a sense of uh, some of the things that uh, my group is looking at actively at Brown. Um, now, uh, one of the things that you might have all seen in the computer vision literature is this recent excitement about neural fields, um, or you know, many people call it implicit representations, 
Uh, we actually think we should call it neural fields for several reasons. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so what is a field? You know, we talk we talk about neural radiance fields. We talk about uh, interaction fields, right? So what what do you mean by a, what do we mean by a field in this context, right? So it turns out that the word field that different people use in the visual computing and computer vision communities is actually from physics, right? In physics, we talk about gravitation fields, electromagnetic fields, uh, and a field is a physical quantity that varies across or has a value across space and time, right? So that's what we mean by a field in, in physics. Um, now, it turns out that in visual computing, many visual computing problems are being represented as neural fields or fields, right? Uh, so this includes things like radiance, it includes things like shape, right? So there's many um, exciting work that's being done in the community on neural fields. And there's been a rapid explosion in the um, in the type of uh, work that's, that we've seen. So just in the last couple of years, we've had over 300 papers that deal with some form of uh, neural fields. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to kind of survey all of the literature in this area and provide some scaffolding and framework for people to understand uh, work in this um, in this exciting new topic, right? Um, and before I do that, you know, this is what a field is, and many uh, you know papers in, in visual computing are formulating problems as uh, neural fields. Uh, what do we mean by neural field? Uh, we try to represent a field. We try to approximate a field using a fully connected neural network. So we have an underlying field that represents some physical quantity. Uh, and this physical quantity is parameterized by X, Y, Z, and time. And we'd like to use a neural network to approximate the underlying physical quantity. So this could be things like shape. It could be things like uh, spatial temporal motion. It could be medical images, or it could be radiance fields. Right? So these are all instances of what we call neural fields. So we are kind of introducing this new term called neural fields to encompass you know, a, a large variety of uh, recent work that's being done in the visual computing literature. I mean, the most famous example of this, of course, is uh, neural radiance fields or NERF that many of you have might have seen before, right? So here, the underlying field is a radiance field. Uh, so essentially, we are, um, you know, trying to figure out which point in XYZ space and viewed across a certain direction, what radiance did, 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 does that particular value have? So that's what NERF uh, essentially does. But NERF is not the only neural field that is out there. There are many different neural fields that you can do for different kinds of uh, problems. So we've written this uh, review paper. Um, you know, this was a collaborative work with a bunch of other faculty, a uh, bunch of other collaborators. Uh, this was led, led by an undergrad here at Brown, Eheng. Um, and this is going to be uh, this is a review and database of over 250. Actually, it's more like 300 papers right now. Um, and this is uh, something that you know is like, easily accessible. You can go to neuralfields.cs.brown.edu, um, and this is like a searchable database of all neural field papers. Uh, and we also provide search functionality. You can add your own papers if you're working in this area. Um, you can uh, try to find papers based on keywords and, and so on and so forth, right? And, and this is a paper that is going to be published at uh, Eurographics next month. Um, and you can find a link to the paper as well on the on the website over here. I'll post this in the newsletter, like just this thing by itself. If there is like a paragraph describing this um, and you can send it to me, I'll add it all to the link so people know what to expect from this link. This is valuable resources for, for people who are following us. Sure, yeah. So we tried to keep it as simple as uh, possible, describing what this work is about. So if you actually go to the Neural Fields website, you'll see a one-line description of what this is. So it's really a review and a database of papers that deal with Neural Fields, right? So, uh, but I'm also happy to send a more detailed uh, account of uh, what we have in the paper. If there is, if there isn't, it's okay. But if you already have like some paragraph about it, just send it over with the link. People okay. will love it. And also, if someone is going to be at CVPR, we have a tutorial that you know is going to talk a little bit more about all of the ways in which we can uh, a taxonomy of of the different works that have been done in, in neural fields. So you, uh, you're uh, welcome to join that. All right, so that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of my students here at Brown and also all of my collaborators who were involved in many of the papers that I talked about. I know that I've, uh, I've ran quite a bit out of, out of time, but I'm happy to take any more questions. Uh, yeah, so I'll speak up first. So uh, you said like the name neural field is, uh, neural fields uh, more aptly defines a continuous representation than uh, say the name implicit representation. Uh, why is that? 
Um, so implicit representations mean different things for different people. Um, but fundamentally, what people mean when they say implicit representation is uh, usually a, a usually shape or radiance that is represented by a neural network, implicitly represented by a neural network. There is no explicit form to it, right? So you cannot directly get what the XYZ position is. You have to actually query a network to figure out what the XYZ position is or what the radiance is, right? So that's typically what people mean when they say implicit representation. Um, on the other hand, it turns out that there are uh, lots of different uh, examples where the term implicit representation may not be the right uh, meaning, may, may not be the right thing, right? So for example, there's neural fields that try to model interactions between different objects or between people and the scene, for instance, right? Um, so, you know, there is no notion of an implicit surface or an implicit radiance or anything of that sort. Um, and, and this is a more general thing. It's a more uh, general application of neural fields. So you can't really call what's going on there an implicit field, um, but you know it, it comes under the broader umbrella, the broader term of uh, neural fields. Uh, hello, can I ask one question? Sure, go for it. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm from TU Delft, Delft University of Technology. And also there's a few uh, students from our lab. Uh, so uh, I, my question is about the 3D canon, uh, canonicalization problem. So where uh, actually we made an assumption that the objects are segmented. So we have individual objects. And I'm thinking this problem in a more general case, for example, in a complex scene, the objects are, you know, are not segmented. So uh, maybe we can, we can take the semantic segmentation problem as an example. So let's see for semantic segmentation, how can we uh, use or how can we uh, exploit can canonicalization to improve semantic segmentation? Do you have any idea or any uh, thoughts? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question um, and something that some of my students are interested in. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer to that. I mean, it, 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 the moment, you know, canonicalization fundamentally so far, that, that we've the way we've looked at it is a very object-centric concept, right? So we, we talk about canonicalizing for object properties, you know, intrinsic properties of objects, extrinsic properties of objects. Now, what, what you're referring to is more of a scene-centric concept or a world-centric concept, where you know the scene of the world contains many objects, uh, and you're interested in canonicalizing or you know finding arrangements or you know uh, something like something that is more it's not object centric anymore, but it's more broader than that in some ways, right? Uh, so I think this is a very interesting question and, and the space is much bigger. So, you know, you cannot assume things like you have a single object, you have you can have any number of objects, you can have different categories of objects. So the problem gets far more complicated. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, I don't have a very good answer to what we should do to solve that problem. Uh, but I do think that, that it's a very, very interesting problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I have one question. So you mentioned about neural fields, right? Uh, I'm thinking how, like, imagine that can also help in this problem of canonicalization. Like I'm thinking something like SDF, uh, because we start with point cloud and we are kind of using only the point cloud or the explicit representation to do the task. Would fitting something like SDF help in that? So I see SDFs and other 3D representations, meshes, point clouds as just one kind of 3D representation, right? Uh, canonicalization is a general concept that is independent of the representation that you use. I mean, the example that I showed obviously was with point clouds, uh, but you could replace those point clouds with other representations, right? So this could be SDFs, it could be meshes, uh, but the fundamental idea still remains the same, uh, which is, you have some 3D representation and you'd like all of that to be in some canonical frame of reference. Um, and, and that's actually a very interesting uh, question for future work. How do we canonicalize for different uh, 3D representations, right? SDFs, uh, meshes, point clouds, voxel grids, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what I'm thinking of is like once you have the SDF, you already have certain feature representation of your scene, right? 
let's say some of the last layers of my network or something like that would having something like that be an additional benefit over what we already dealt with well um in the in the architecture that i described uh, earlier um we do have these represent these uh, features these higher order features in right. fact that's actually how we do segmentation so it turns out that for segmentation uh, you know tfns give us um, I mean, I'm, I'm skipping through many of the details here, but right. TFNs are giving us some features. Um, we also have a trick here that we use to make these features invariant. Um, and these features are the ones that are used for segmentation. Right? Uh, and, and, you know, TFNs don't care whether the input is a point cloud or if it's a sample from an SDF, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they could all be equivalent. So you could really think of replacing the input point cloud here with, a, uh, with an SDF, for example. Uh, and you know you could, with a few modifications to the to the architecture, you could uh, directly try to process STFs as well. Got it. Hmm. Thank you. So uh, this question is more like a thought experiment. Uh, so what if we could uh, learn the scene representation itself and not say that it's an SDF or a radiance field or something or a mesh? Just what if? Is, is it is that even possible? Um, so, what do you mean by learning the scene representation? Do you mean a neural network that encodes exactly. the scene does? Yes, but not something like an SDF or like with these approaches, we sort of uh, expect uh, what the neural network encodes. Right? I'm I'm saying we learn the essence of the scene representation itself. Like, what's the right scene of representation? I mean, that's a, so, so there's, you know, when, when we try to model scenes, there's two kinds of approaches that we could take, right? So we can have an explicit representation of the scene or an implicit representation of the scene. Um, and let's say we focus on shape, right? So an explicit representation of shape is things like voxels, point clouds, meshes. These are all explicit shape representations. Um, Implicit representations are things like SDFs. SDFs are an implicit representation of the scene. You can also learn a neural network that implicitly represents the scene. Um, so there, there has to be some something that the network optimizes for in the end, right? So it's either the, the radiance, which is the case of NERF, or it has to be the SDF, which is the case of deep SDF, right? There has to be something that the network focuses on. And in the process, you get weights of the network that encode something about your scene, right? Um, but if you don't have any bias, or if you don't have a task that the network has to solve, um, you know, it's it's likely that you're not going to extract meaningful representations of, of the scene, right? I mean, the whole reason why NERF actually ends up giving a 3D representation or learning a 3D representation of the scene is because it's trained to solve the novel view synthesis task. So we'd like to figure out how the scene looks like when viewed from a certain viewpoint. And it turns out that the best way to do that is uh, to do full 3D reconstruction. And it turns out that that's what NERF ends up doing, right? Um, but yeah, without any such task, I don't know if you know we can bias the network to learning something useful. Um, so I don't, I don't know what you were thinking about in terms of what this task would be. Yeah, I think, yeah, I was thinking something along those directions that you answered, but like not knowing what you want to optimize for before it makes it harder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, this is it for the questions, Sivat. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, we will wait for this link, uh, especially I'd love to, 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 to play around with this uh, web page. Um, people in attendance, thanks for joining. Um, I'll link again to everywhere where you can find uh, all the details about our community, especially where I'm going to publish the recording for this event uh, with the chapters and everything. It'll be in our newsletter, it will be in the Reddit, the Discord, everywhere. Um, in the Discord, there's like a live chat going on about questions and answers in our fields of computer vision and graphics. So feel free to join. Um, 
Yeah, I would uh, wish everybody a good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world from. Um, and until, uh, also, by the way, before I forget, all the references we discussed, enough, I'm already sending you an email asking for this, will be posted on the, on the event page, on the recording, so you'll have everything. Um, yeah, and with this, uh, if anybody has a remark, it's a good time. Otherwise, uh, we're going to finish off for today. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining everyone, and thanks for the great questions. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.